And I think one of the reasons why we can't get rid of the inefficiency is because inefficiency is perfect lubrication for corruption. It's the ideal lubricant. You just need an inefficient operating environment, and guess what? All the people that want to do the wrong thing are going to do the wrong thing, and they're going to get away with it. That's the situation we have. Business principles dictate that you have to do things a certain way. One of the ways of managing efficient business is empowering your local business units so they can do the work while you oversight. Now that is true of business, it's also true of government. We have a youth bulge. We need one million jobs. Well, how do we get those jobs? We're not going to get them through the Connect PNG contractor. We know that already. Even government says, look, we've created 30,000 jobs through Connect PNG. Well, where's the other 970,000 that we want? That's going to come from the private sector. Every country on earth generates jobs through the private sector. Professors, uh, distinguished academics, visiting friends from overseas, and all our special guests, especially the students who are here today. It is, uh, it is a great honor because I've never spoken at this particular event before. So uh, I feel particularly uh, privileged that I get this opportunity and to speak to very intelligent people uh, is not something I get the opportunity to do often, um, given, given my current job. So um, it is indeed a huge pleasure. Let me just say that. And I'll, I'll try to do it justice. And I, I was talking to a friend and I said, look, what am I supposed to say at this particular event? And the advice was, do your thing. Uh, and at the end, try and inspire everyone. And I thought, inspiring people is going to be a little bit difficult in this particular climate that we find ourselves in. And yesterday, I, I had a, we had, the opposition had a caucus meeting. So I told my colleagues, look, I'm speaking at the uh, PNG update tomorrow. What should I say? And of course, we've got a lot of really young, aggressive, articulate uh, members of parliament. I love those uh, young, young people. And they said to me, go out there and just kill the prime minister because he, he didn't do a good job yesterday. And, and I thought, yeah, the, the, uh, the vigor of youth, you know, let's just go out and knock everything over. And I thought, I thought no, let's, let's, let's tone it down a little bit and let's do this properly. But as I was uh, putting together my notes over the last few months, uh, something struck me. And I had a bit of a laugh to myself. I thought, oh my God, everything I'm writing down here is actually in the textbook. <laughs> everything I want to talk about, all of you already know. It's not like new knowledge at all. It's every other country has done it and they've gone down through the sequence of things and it's been tried and tested and I thought, this sounds like we're back in the classroom. It's just, it's just so academic, so basic, we're back in the classroom. But anyway, let's do it so that it's on the record. Uh, I think mostly because I think the policy makers need to understand that this is not rocket science at all. You don't need Einstein to help you with this. It's, it's quite simple. The, the various steps that different countries have gone to to secure a stable environment for growth and development has been done many times. Many countries have done it. It's just that somehow Papua New Guinea wants to find our own way. Disregarding the large body of studies and information. Now you mean like Wogim Law, like blue, you mean. Now, I don't need to go through all the challenges with you. You, you all know it. And, and therein lies, if you're going to do this like a study, that's your problem statement right there. I have said it in Parliament, and I'll say it here. 
PNG has all the hallmarks of a failing state. It's all there. You just go through the definition of a failing state and we tick all the boxes. So that's the problem statement right there. It's very simple. Any government should come and take a look at it and the very first thing we ought to do is to be honest with ourselves. I know it's nice to say, look, we're the richest black Christian nation, but we're not. We are rich, but we're squandering those resources. We're not investing them in the right places. We pass a budget that ought to tie funding to very specific areas, and it looks good on paper, but what do we do when we get down to the nuts and bolts of it? The funds get allocated to political priorities, not to developmental priorities. I was shocked when the governor for Gulf province raised the issue in the papers, and I thought, let me go and dig a little bit deeper. So when I went and had a look, last year, some provinces managed to pick up almost a billion kina in additional funding that was not approved in the budget. And where was it cut? It was cut from health. It was cut from education. It was cut from policing. It was cut from all of the essential areas. And discreetly, secretly, bundled around. Now, we then turn around and conveniently blame foreign advisors or whoever else is a convenient scapegoat. But the fact of the matter is that everybody that sat down and did these documents to push these funds to where they were not supposed to go are all bona fide Papua New Guineans. So, power, water, fuel, FX, law and order, justice. Papua New Guinea is a very difficult place to do business in. It's just a fact. Ask any business. In the last three years, I have met seven billionaires from China. As we know, since the good president of China has installed himself for life, many of the very wealthy Chinese are leaving. They're looking for a safe country to, to basically continue doing their business. And many of them are very legitimate businessmen. One particular businessman I met is worth 40 billion US dollars. Now he has, he only managed to take out 10 billion US dollars. He sacrificed the rest and left it in China. He settled in Australia with his family and he's looking for business opportunities in the Pacific. His simple reasoning, well, this is my backyard now. Now he's been to Papua New Guinea on and off, looking for opportunities all over the country uh, for about four years. When I met him about two months ago, he said this to me, he said, it was so difficult dealing with your last minister for X department. He kept asking for a lot of money and stalled my licenses. Now the new minister is actually worse than the last one. <laughs> and, and he's looking at me matter-of-factly, he's not joking or anything. And I'm feeling a little bit uh, ashamed because this is my country and this is one of my colleagues he's talking about. Now, if this is a person that's willing to come and invest one or two or three billion dollars in our country, and we are setting up all kinds of roadblocks, not to mention that, for starters, wherever he wants to set up the business, he has to generate his own power, he has to find his own police, he has to uh, produce his own water, train his workforce. I mean, he has to invest in all of these things just to get his business to a point where it can operate like in any other part of the world. Now, these people are looking here, and they're struggling. 
So they come to ECP because they hear that, well, there's a governor there that's doing things a little bit differently. Now, when they come to me, we try to help them. And I've done something that no other province has done before. I now have, a, I have four deputy administrators. All provinces have three. Our fourth one, that person's job, the fourth deputy uh, administrator, is to deal with people like this. We, we're calling it economic services, the, the deputy administrator for economic services. So we can try to figure out how we can get these people to feel comfortable, give them confidence, and so they can come and invest. Because it is just too hard to do business in Papua New Guinea. That's just a fact. So how do we do it? Again, as I said, it's not rocket science. I'm just going to go through the list for you. <clears throat> and I think, as I said, 99% of you sitting here already know what I'm going to say. So I'm going to have to try to make this sound exciting, because it won't be. Um, but here's the thing. Most of my colleague members of parliament and those that are making policy decisions, they probably don't understand these things. And that's another fact. The most important thing is that capital around the world has to move freely. And in countries where it can move in and out freely, that's where the bulk of the investments take place. Now, Papua New Guinea, because we are so resource rich, we tend to do the lazy thing and fall back on the resources. I, I see a lot of Papua New Guineans, especially on social media, they'll post about Fiji. Well, Fiji is doing brilliantly because it has no resources. They have to operate at the same level as the rest of the world following these rules. So they can attract the investment that will then give them the economic growth they need and the quality of life they want for their people. They are forced to do it. Unlike us, we just have to fall back and relax because we're an island of gold floating on a sea of oil and we've got gas spurting all over the place. So that's the easy way out. We take that. In the process, we forget that investors and even our own people, the number one thing we all need is a safe and secure environment. So law and order, without doubt, has to be number one. Now, many of us have, have talked about this. I'll give you an example. My province has 160 policemen. 40 of them are about to retire, so I have 120. My province is twice the size of Fiji. The population of my province is almost the same as Fiji. Fiji has five and a half thousand policemen. So obviously they've figured something out that we're still not understanding. That's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is what we keep talking about. We need policy stability. Not political stability. Australia changes prime ministers every three years, but the policy environment remains stable stable over decades, and we've got great policy. They're all collecting dust. I, I, I'm not even sure when we actually pick one up to read it. We just spend a whole heap of money getting very brilliant people to design them, and then we kill a lot of pigs, and we have this big celebration. We launch the policy, then we put it away, and we forget about it until the next minister comes along and we do another policy just to show that we can do policies. But whether we implement them or not is an entirely different matter. Economic diversification. Now, I feel sad when I mention this one. We've been talking about this to death, 40 years of talking about economic diversification. We just haven't done it. And I, I keep asking, I've been in, in Parliament seven years now. Well, this will be my seventh year. And I, I keep asking myself, why not? I've had these discussions in government caucus. 
I've gotten upset in government caucus. I've walked out of government caucus. I've exited government caucus many times and been put back on. But we're still nowhere near working on this particular item. My other favorite, investment in productive capacity. And I think I was, I was very excited to read one of the IMF reports a couple of years back where they actually said the same thing. Papua New Guinea needs to invest in its productive capacity. Now, what does that mean? Well, a couple of budgets ago, we gave a lot of money to the Livestock Development Corporation. And I was very excited. I'm like, okay. Because I did recall saying to the Prime Minister one time when they were going to do Connect PNG from Leh all the way through to Jayapura. And I said, what for? We just need a ship to go from Leh to Medang, Wiwek, and Jayapura, right? I mean, a ship is going to cost 5% or even less, 2% of what, what building the road is going to cost. And they're like, no, 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 we need the road so we can take all the cows to Jayapura. We're meeting with the Indonesians, and the Indonesians want cattle. And, you know, we're going to supply cattle. I'm like, well, where's the cattle? Livestock Development Corporation gets a whole bunch of money, and I'm thinking, all right, we're going to get some breeding stock. And we're going to put this breeding stock around the country, and that's going to develop our ability to produce cattle. What do they actually do? They're building abattoirs. Almost in every province. Nice fence, big fancy building. Again, where's the cow? I know it sounds stupid, doesn't it? And that's what, what, that's what I don't get. I mean, how silly is that? When in, 20, in 2017, when I read a report that cocoa was going to go gangbusters around the world because there's going to be uh, a 12% shortage of supply coming out of uh, West Africa, now I find out it's actually a 30% deficit in supply and it's going to last for another five years. What did I do? I invested in productive capacity. What's productive capacity in cocoa? Well, you actually need a cocoa plant, right, to produce a cocoa pod. I know it sounds silly. <laughs> so what's the best way to do that? Well, you need a nursery. Go back to basics. So what did we do? We developed 600 budwood nurseries. We have more cocoa nurseries in Pacific than the entire South Pacific combined. How much did it cost us? Two million kina. That's all. Now almost every single village in East and West Sipik, we've got cocoa nurseries up in Telefomin. Now that's the, like I said, I feel that I'm offending you by telling you this, seriously. That's what you need to do. So this week, uh, my good friend, the member for North Fly, now wants his people to grow cocoa. They, they actually got vanilla from us, and they're doing vanilla, which is great. And he's going to send an aircraft to, to WeWEC to pick up cocoa seedlings so they can start their nurseries. Isn't that amazing? I've got CPICs who did the work in East CPIC now in Gulf province. They're in Central province. They're all over the country doing precisely what we did from 2018, 19, 20, and what we're still doing. So that model is now being moved around the country. It's very simple, but here's the deal. We've never produced more than 40,000 tons of cocoa in this country. But we've got land and labor available that can do a million tons a year. But for almost 50 years, we've just gone nowhere with it. You can, you can say the same thing for cocoa and, you know, the new favorite, cattle. I think I've spent too much time on that. Strategic infrastructure development. Now, I've just, people talk about infrastructure development. I like to add that word in front, strategic infrastructure development. 
see, we need to get our produce, whatever it is, whether it be cows or sheep or whatever, to market. We don't necessarily need to take it from province to province. So the infrastructure needs to take us to a port. And here's the thing. All the literature tell us that 95% of world trade takes place on the water. We are hardly investing in the ports that need to carry the trade, but we are investing crazily on road infrastructure. And I'm not going to knock that. All I'm saying is let's be strategic. Where do we need to put the roads in first to take us to a port so we can get this country viable? Reduce some of the inefficiencies that surround doing business in our country. Reduce that. Strategic infrastructure. Power. That's my other favorite. The Minister for State Enterprises and I have a lot of arguments over this. One of the main reasons why I supported changing government in the first place and getting Marape in was to fix power. I wanted power fixed. Not just fixed, but bring the cost down. Papua New Guineans pay one kina 20 toya for a kilowatt of power. The Indonesians pay for the same amount of power, 40 toya. One third what we pay for it. Now, if I was a Chinese billionaire looking for a place to do business and it needed a lot of power, and Indonesia is selling power at 40 toya and Papua New Guinea is selling it for one kina 20, where do I go if that is going to be a critical need in my business? A lot of people don't understand that it's the comparative advantages that attract investment. As I said, I've met seven of these billionaires. The only reason they will come to Papua New Guinea is if there is a significant advantage to their business. I'm not even going to talk about FX. I read one of the professors actually already did that here. No foreign business is going to bring a billion dollars into Papua New Guinea and invest and create jobs and help us grow our economy and improve the quality of life of our people if they can't get their money out. Again, it is so simple, I feel stupid saying it. My other favorite, good governance and anti-corruption, yes, everyone's smiling. They know this one. You all know this one. Look, I said this at a Lowy Institute interview, I think 15 years ago in Sydney. And I said this, in Papua New Guinea, we're a country where you can get away with a lot of wrongdoing. So what do we do? We do a lot of wrongdoing and we get away with it. A lot of the people that want to invest in our country want to know that when they come in, the rules that apply to them apply equally to everyone else. But if someone can go and hand a brown paper bag to someone working in government and get a leg up, an unfair advantage, then you push out those genuine investors who are going to come and contribute to your economy, employ your people, train your people, and pay taxes. But here's the thing. Papua New Guinea is a highly inefficient country. And I think one of the reasons why we can't get rid of the inefficiency is because inefficiency is perfect lubrication for corruption. It's the ideal lubricant. You just need an inefficient operating environment, and guess what? 
All the people that want to do the wrong thing are going to do the wrong thing and they're going to get away with it. That's the situation we have. And the good people, well, they'll just give up and go to another country, won't they? Education and skills, I know you've already talked about that. I'll just leave that. Health and social services, another one. I was talking to a, a couple of governors the other day, and because of the work we've done around health in the East Cipic, uh, the East Cipic people and the West Cipic people now have a total of 46 doctors working in the province. Now, we are second only in the number of doctors we have to Port Mosby. We ran short of doctors to a point where we had to get, and, and specialist doctors, that we had to get permission from Treasury to recruit outside of Papua New Guinea, bring in foreign medical specialists to run our facility. And it hit me. If that is a similar need around the country, and if every province is going to go the same way, then just in the number of health workers Doctors are going to increase, the supporting medical workers are going to increase. Can you imagine the amount of money that we need to spend just on remunerations? And we haven't even planned for that. But I do know that we plan to build a lot more hospitals. And that is something very significant that I think is going to hit us three years down the track. I only know because ECPIC is moving in that direction. That's why I know. And I shared this with some of my colleague governors the other day because I was worried. Environmental sustainability. Yeah, I know, Prof. It, it was going to come up anyway, so don't worry. <laughs> and, and I won't say anything. I'll just stop there. Regional and international partnerships. Again, it's, it's a textbook. I'm, I'm going through this like a textbook. So, but I think there's so many market opportunities. I read a market report that said that by 2030, the food required in Asia is going to, well, Asia is going to need an additional, I think it was $4 trillion worth of food. Just Asia, by 2030. Significant opportunity, again, like the cocoa that's coming up. And we just talk about us being the food bowl of wherever. And again, productive capacity. I'll leave it there. I don't want to criticize. I'll just stop there. Community engagement, local development. Many of you in here, this is, I think, the lecture hall for the School of Business. Am I right? OK. Business principles dictate that you have to do things a certain way. One of the ways of managing efficient business is empowering your local business units so they can do the work while you oversight. Now, that is true of business. It's also true of government. What we have done is centralized to a point where all significant decision making occurs here. Now, if I am to give you a perspective in my province, everything that's failing in my province, law and order, it's a national government responsibility. It's not a provincial government responsibility. Power, that's a national government responsibility. It's not a provincial government responsibility. Water, also a national government responsibility, not a provincial government responsibility. Our highways and port, again, national government responsibility. One of my arguments is that you need to empower the business units so they solve those problems themselves. It is about efficiency. We need to introduce efficiency into our systems of government. I've spoken a lot about block grants and many of you are familiar with that. There's a simple reason for me wanting a block grant. 
it leads to efficiency if you do it properly. Other countries have done it, and they've done it very well. My key question is, why haven't we? Now, I believe that if we empower the local business units, they can create the havens we need for investment to take place so that we can get the jobs and all these other things that we talk about. As I said, fairly basic, a five-year-old with a smartphone can Google it. So, let's get to the how. How do we do it? Again, it's very basic. PNG needs a strategic business plan that helps us to turn around. We don't have one at the moment. And even if we did, it's not worth talking about it because you need to be in a position to implement it. And that's got to be broken up at six-month intervals. If we determine as a country that law and order is our number one priority, we then have to, like the planning department says, we need a million jobs. Okay, well, how do we get the million jobs? We have a limited bucket of money. We've got to invest in the critical areas first, but here's the thing. Government tends to forget that the biggest investor you can bring to the table is the private sector. And by private sector, I don't just mean the big companies. I mean the mums and dads as well, many of you sitting in this room. If you know and you have the confidence that this country is going to go in the right direction, you are going to go and take your savings out and you are going to invest. You are going to send some money home to your relatives and tell them, go down to the CCI depot and pick up a thousand uh, cocoa seedlings and come plant them in, on our block. I'm talking about that kind of low-level grassroots investment. That's also private sector. The people themselves are going to start investing. That kind of confidence can only come if the big picture is pointing in a direction where we know that we are all going to have a fair, equal operating environment. We list all the issues, we prioritize them, and then we monitor them. We should be checking at six monthly intervals how we are progressing with the plan. I've been in parliament seven years, been in government four and a half years. I have never seen us monitor the outcomes of the budgets that we do. We just spend money. That's got to change if we want to see us moving in the right direction. We have a youth bulge. We need one million jobs. Well, how do we get those jobs? We're not going to get them through the Connect PNG contractor. We know that already. Even government says, look, we've created 30,000 jobs through Connect PNG. Well, where's the other 970,000 that we want? That's going to come from the private sector. Every country on earth generates jobs through the private sector. We just keep missing that point here in PNG. We think government needs to generate that job, those jobs that we need. Again, it comes back to the confidence. How do we give the confidence to the private sector so that they can invest their money? And again, large scale foreign direct investors all the way down to local investors in country to moms and dads. When you, and, and this is why I like medical people. Medical people are very matter of fact. If you bring in 20 people or 25 people from a PMV accident to the hospital, this is what the medical people will do. They will come out and do an assessment and they will figure out which ones can be saved and which ones can't be saved. So they make a decision. It's called a triage. So they will actually let some of the people pass away because they can't help them. 
I honestly think that we should be taking a triage approach to Papua New Guinea. Of course, everyone wants roads, everyone wants health centers, everyone wants brilliant schools. I've got 760 schools in my province. But we've got to make some value decisions, and we've got to do that knowing that we're sacrificing in some areas because the basket just isn't big enough. We invest in the critical areas. When I was investing in cocoa from 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, even today, a lot of my people said, well, why can't you invest in rice and why can't you invest here and there and everywhere? And I said, I've only got one million kina. I'm sorry. We're only going to do one thing. Many of them hated me for it at the beginning, but they're happy now. We've got to do the same thing to the country. These are hard decisions. They're not easy, but they have to be taken. When you're running a country, just like when you're running a business, you can't make everyone happy. Someone said, if you want to do that, go sell ice cream. Running a country isn't about selling ice cream. You're going to upset some people, but it must be done so that everybody gets a fair shake and everybody gets a fair opportunity. I always like to work at a problem backwards. Figure out what your problem is and then you work backwards to the nuts and bolts. Uh, Professor Mel was talking about vanilla. Do I have time or am I going out of time? I've only got three pages. I'm finishing. Um, and a lot of people ask me, why vanilla? I went to my village in 1993 to bury my father. I was working at, uh, my grandfather, sorry. I was working at Octedi at the time. And when I got home, everyone in ECP was scared to go to my district. It was the crime capital of Sipik. So when I got onto a PMV in Wewek, some of the mothers, the Sipik mothers came up to me and said, son, get off this PMV. The people that own that PMV are going to take you somewhere and kill you. Because that's what they do. They didn't realize that I was one of those people. <laughs> so when I got home, I got all my cousins together after we buried my grandfather. Nami Semia. So I said, why are you guys doing this? And one of my cousins, who's, who's dead now, he said, and he died from diabetes, funny thing. Because when, uh, when he started making money, he said to me, I am never going to eat another yam, taro, banana, or saksak ever again. I'm going to eat rice and bread and biscuit until I die. And he did. <laughs> so he stood up in the village and says to me, Kas. We have enough food in the garden. But when your nieces and nephews are crying for twisties or a bicycle, I got no money. So we all have to stand at the road and just hold up all the trucks and get cash so I can buy your, your nephew a bicycle. Again, problem statement. So I sat down and thought about all the things that I should be doing to help my people. The first thing I settled on was marijuana. Let's grow it and smuggle it into Australia. Today it's legal, but we were thinking about it 30 years ago. <laughs> so I was, I was ahead of the curve even back then. Now I'm telling my colleagues in parliament, we should be growing marijuana and selling it to the rest of the world because it grows 10 times as fast here than anywhere else in the world. But no, we're a rich black Christian country, so we can't do those things. <laughs> anyway, back to vanilla. Eventually... We settled on vanilla, and a good friend of mine, we were working together in Octedi. He's now a uh, country manager for Wafi Golpo, David Wissing. David was working community affairs, and we were helping to build the rubber plant in Kyunga at the time. And he said to me, why don't you try vanilla? I'm like, what's vanilla? So he showed me a couple of pictures. We were just getting on the internet in those days. Um, so we had 
of course, mainframe com computers, no laptops or anything like that. And so I started to do a little bit of research, and I realized that we've got these plants at home. I don't know why, but I've seen them in the bush. So when I brought the pictures back and showed them to my cousins, they're like, yeah, yeah, it's in the bush. I'm like, where did they get them? They were like, no, we got them from the agricultural station. The Australians brought it here in the 1960s to do experiments at the egg station at Bainik. And my people have this yam growing culture where we grow these really long yams. We like to tell the million base, yours is a small one. <laughs> I, was, I was this big. Um, anyway, so part of the ritual for growing the long yams involves a, an indigenous vanilla vine. So when the guys in the village, they saw all these, uh, the vines brought in by the white men, they thought, hmm, malirab long yam by strong moyet, yam by go tribe So they stole the vanilla plant. Uh, that's how we ended up with a lot of vanilla vines in Isipik. And you all know the rest of the story. But that's the thing. It was to solve a problem. And I, I like to give this example. In those days, a woman from, the, from Pagui on the Sipic River would smoke fish, put them in bags. She would go and stay in a village. And she would take maybe a month to sell her fish. So she would be away from her family for a month before she went back to the village. Today, she just gets on her mobile phone rings one of her business partners, who is another woman in another village. They'll meet in Maprik or somewhere on the highway. She sells her fish, picks up the cash, buys her, the things for her family, and she's back home that very afternoon. That's the power of developing a local microeconomy. People have more time at home. Not only that, the people from Wiwek along the coastline who never used to sell fish inland, they now take their catch inland and sell it inland because the people inland have an income. So you suddenly have this multiplier effect going through the community. That's what we have in Isipik at the moment. It's going to a point where we run out of things like bottled water every week. We run out of milk. We run out of cooking oil. We run out of rice. We run out of fuel regularly. And we need a deeper port because we need bigger ships to come in so they, we don't have the shortages on the shelf. People complain to me and say, oh, we're running out of fuel. I'm like, yeah, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> I don't want the crime, but running out of fuel, someone can step in and deal with that. So I've spoken a bit too long. I've oversimplified it, I know. But that's the way I like to do things. I like to take a complex problem break it down into its simple, implementable parts. And here's the thing. We worry about money a lot. We worry about money in the national budget. We worry about money in the national economy. We worry about money in the pockets of ordinary folks. The thing is, money is like a river. It's just, it just flows. What you need to do is you need to tap into it. The world trade is in trillions of dollars. We just need to be smart enough to tap into it so some of it comes our way. Again, I'm oversimplifying it, but I think that's the way you solve every problem. You break it down from its most complicated to its least complex so that it can be implemented by ordinary citizens. And these ordinary citizens need to have the confidence that if they do these things, tomorrow is going to be better. That's what they need. So thank you all very much for listening. I'm going to take a seat. And I hope that was a little bit inspiring. But again, I don't want to come up with a new problem statement. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'll go first. Thank you very much, Governor, for your very uh, comprehensive uh, speech. And, uh, you know, one issue you didn't mention was uh, gender-based violence, violence against women and girls. And uh, actually, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor both addressed that very clearly. So I just wanted to give you, ask, ask, give you the opportunity to comment on that very important issue. Thank you.
Uh, thanks, Prof. I'll have to refer to my phone. Uh, as you know, I'm still Deputy Chair of um, um, the Gender Equity and Women's Empowerment Committee, which is what it's called now. Um, and I've actually got a report uh, back from some of our some of our uh, stakeholders. Now, so far, in terms of Saab and that's sorcery-related violence and gender-based violence, and as you know, I took a bill to the floor. We've got three perpetrators who have been sentenced to life as a result of that work. Two other perpetrators have 25 years. One has got 24 years, and another one has got five. Now, we've got 64 awaiting trial. That's part of the work we've done. So getting beyond just the advocacy, and which is all very necessary, I think that perpetrators need to be punished. Perpetrators need to know that there's a limit to the things they can and can't do. So one of the things we've been focusing on, uh, myself and Governor Parkop, who is the chair of the committee, is to focus on the nuts and bolts of getting things done so that our women and girls feel safe in the community. Um, I used to complain a lot about the fact that we weren't doing enough, but I'm happy to see that some of the work we've done through the committee, we now have uh, dedicated gender uh, specialists in the police force around the country, and if there aren't any, we're getting them in. We've got provincial governments to start funding those offices, so we've come a long way in the, in the last five years uh, with that work. So again, beyond the advocacy, getting perpetrators punished, I think is important, because the thing that's missing in Papua New Guinea, in my view, is justice. Once people know that justice is going to be served, and I, I love this idea that a female constable in Australia can arrest a very powerful minister of state in Papua New Guinea and <laughs> put him before the law. I don't think any Papua New Guinean powerful men are going to face courts given our current system and given our current level of policing. So for me personally, I think justice is an indispensable part of this whole equation, not just for gender-based violence, but for every other crime that's perpetrated in our country. Thank you for the wonderful talk. It's not just a talk, not, just in, not only inspiring, you are now looking at the future. You mentioned about everything, but you touched and, touched and went about one, one important thing, that's a higher education. We need people like you with the great thinking and great qualification. Unfortunately, every successive government, they've completely ignored higher education, starting with bachelor's, master's, and PhD. You can see, when you say master's and PhD, people say, we'll go to Australia, or UK, or US. Why not Papua New Guinea? because we are not building the capacity locally. What is your take on that one? These people with the high knowledge, they can make the difference. We are seeing the same problem again and again. I am in the country for the last 25 years. I'm hearing the same problem again and again. We need a different thinking and with a different knowledge and skill. What is your take on that one? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. I, I'm, I'm, I might be a little bit biased because I know many of you, so let me just say that uh, as a disclaimer. I think that knowledge generated that is environment specific is important. Whilst I appreciate that it's important that we do, uh, for those that go out and do their masters and PhD qualifications overseas, I think it's also important that we do that here. And one of the things that uh, myself and others, I'm on the NRI council as a board member, and we've argued for, for example, research grants so that we can start doing some of that work in country. So that you do provide those opportunities for research in country. I think part of the problem comes from not being able to fund the studies so, and, and to fund those, those particular qualifications. So um, we are working 
on it from a different angle. And as you know, I think this year, government has allocated some funds for, for research so that we can, yeah, yeah, one million. Again, they give you one million. They gave us one million too for economy. There you go. So we've got to do a lot more. I agree with you. Uh, and, and again, we've got to recognize that knowledge that is generated. And one of the things, uh, Professor uh, Kalowin is sitting here. I'm really keen on research knowledge generated from some of our indigenous species that may have um, commercial value, not just that, but perhaps humanitarian value for the planet into the future. And as you know, we haven't done that work. So totally agree with you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. My name is Logia Now I'm a researcher with the PNG National Research Institute. Now I'm of the view that economies of scale are important for Papua New Guinea. So my question to um, Honorable Governor is, the special economic zones, do you think it's, um, do you think it's a step in the right direction? Um, and also, do you think it's, it's a step in the right direction? It's providing the right incentives for investors, but at the same time in an environment where we need a tax revenue, especially given the tax con large tax, tax concessions that have been given. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you. Um, when you look at the way we set up, for example, the mining and the oil and gas operations, in my view, they're special economic zones, if you look at the legislation, the specific legislation that goes with each one. So in a way, I think we've been doing this, but perhaps not so much in some of the other industries, downstream processing and whatever not that are being considered now. So in terms of calling it a special economic zone, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, but I, I'd put it again, work backwards. What do we need? We need jobs. We need to see the picture from a larger perspective. So I think we need a policy that deals with this, the issue. And that policy needs to be directed towards achieving certain outcomes. For me personally, I want the jobs. So if I want the jobs, I think the policy that deals with these special economic zones needs to point back to jobs. So if we sacrifice, like, I don't think it's a good idea to keep giving government lots and lots of money. In the last five years, we have had record budgets and very low impact in the community. So giving more money in Texas to politicians is probably not a good idea, in my view. But if we can organize commercial activities in such a way that, for example, we have a special operator with their own terms and conditions, 20 years tax-free, whatever it is, operating somewhere in Papua New Guinea, and they employ 5,000 people. That's 5,000 Papua New Guineans feeding their families, putting their kids through school, buying their own homes. I would gladly sacrifice 20 years of uh, company income, uh, company taxes for the 5,000 jobs. Because as a government, you then collect other taxes. You're collecting taxes from GST and, and so these 5,000 people that are making the money and spending that money in that community, you end up taxing them anyway. And if they spend the money and someone else spends the money, well, you end up taxing that same kina two or three times. So I think we need to expand our thinking beyond and not just call it a special economic zone. I, I would like to see it as special exemptions so that we can get the things that we want. I hope that answers your question. So I'm not a big fan of calling them like, I don't like the idea of having a hotel in Port Mosby that's a special economic zone. There's nothing special about that. But if you were to bring in a manufacturing plant to produce glass or to smelt aluminum or something like that, and it's gonna create 5,000 jobs and you give that a special exemption under law, for the 5,000 jobs and the livelihoods of those Papua New Guineans, 
I think that needs to be the way we do it. And I'm not sure how it's being done at the moment. So let me just say that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Governor Alan Bird, uh, Dr. Amanda Watson from Australian National University. Uh, you're a wonderful orator. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. There was just one word I couldn't understand. It was five or ten minutes before the end of your speech and you said, as you know, I'm keen on and it sounded like you were saying blog roll or something like that. I, I think a few of us were wondering what, you, what the word was and what you meant. Apologies, we, that was the one thing we just didn't catch. Thank you. Uh, that was a block grant. I'm sorry, it could have been the microphone. Now, as you know, in Australia, the federal government uses a block grant system with the state governments. So you, you've actually got a small federal government and you've got large state governments. That's a deliberate design in Australia. So the federal government designs policy, monitors policy, and then you have inspections going on in the states to make sure that they're spending the money to achieve the outcomes that I guess all of Australia wants. So I'm arguing for the same system that the people of Australia currently enjoy. And the people of the United States, the people of India, the people of China and Europe and basically every, every other country except us. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Our Chinese proverb, give a man a fish, or give a person a fish, and the person will be dependent on that fish for life. You teach a person how to fish, and the person will fish for life. And we break that dependency syndrome that Papua New Guinea is still strong 49 years on since independence. Governor, I didn't hear your thoughts on education, sorry. Coming from an education background, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I had a question from Prof. Pillai on higher education. Like you, I'm concerned about the basics up, the top down, uh, bottom up approach. I like your transformation leadership. And I'm proud to be a civic woman and a civic academic, and I'm proud that you're my governor. <laughs> governor? Sorry, Mr. Bird. What is your thought on Basic education, curriculum design, development, aligning with, when I say basic, that's early childhood, primary, secondary, and up to the tertiary space. I've been an educator in Papua New Guinea for more than 32 years. 15 years in the Teaching Service Commission, and about 22 years here at UPNG. And it's the same question. Yesterday I attended an education session. It's about training. We're still doing training 49 years on. Yes, it does help. That empowerment you were talking about when wealth creation to the village people, to the local. We need that in every sector in Papua New Guinea. What are your thoughts on aligning the curriculum so that when we get students at UPNG and other tertiary institutions, they have critical, you know, learning, critical skills, critical research, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. I, I think it's, uh, we made a change some years back, but the early system we had where kids were streamed either to the technical areas or, or to academia, and it really comes back to the standards that we want. I know the universities are now struggling with uh, things like literacy levels, understanding, being able to write, uh, and obviously we've lost it at the lower level. So I just think we, de we need to bring back those standards. That, that's all we need to do. And then to be clear about what we are building these young people for, I always ask the question, what are we educating our people for, especially the young ones? So, for example, if we know, like, the Philippine approach, the Philippines are training their people to work in other countries. They've got a production line that produces human beings that are work ready for other countries. I mean, do we want that or do we want a mix? These are, I think, policy discussions that need to take place from you academics. And you need to tell us, because you have to understand, there aren't too many highly educated people in parliament. Uh, there might be a few, but you know, when we become politicians, we tend to think differently. But that's another matter entirely. Uh, I'm on camera now, so many of my colleagues won't be happy with me. Uh, but the thing is, that one of the things I didn't say, and it was in my notes, is that I would like to see 
empirical evidence feed into policy so that we are then driving, again, being committed, having that stable policy environment to drive that policy so that we get the outcomes. Again, working backwards from the problem. So I, I hope that answers your question. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elia Sangundi. My question is, as you, you as a best alternative prime uh, opposition prime minister of Papua New Guinea, my question is, mm -hmm. my question is, what is your, what, according to your observation, what is your, what is the core problem of our country? It is the corruption or it is the leadership? Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, let me just say that we have many problems, many challenges. Um, and I think I've mentioned some of them. The reason why I talk about agriculture is that, you know, man blah lotu, time you ask him a man blah question, he'll default to the Bible. Uh, I've, I've been working agriculture ever since I was a young man. So it's in my blood. It speaks to me. It's something that I'm more comfortable in. So I try to explain things using agricultural terms because so when you ask someone who is a politician, they'll, they'll speak to you in politics speak. Huh? We all have our own different languages and nuances. So I, I hope that explains that. Now, coming back to what you say, I think land is critical, but there are ways you can get around it. For example, the cocoa people that we target in East Sipi, they're all smallholders, so they're doing it on their own land. They're not doing it on state land. So what we try to do is, and it comes back to your basic, uh, how shall I say, your basic um, requirements for production to take place in an economy. You need land, you need labor, you need capital, and you need entrepreneurship and skills, right? Amongst other things, but the basic stuff is there. Uh, some of you might recall, um, some years back, uh, I was fortunate to be part of a, uh, doing a policy for government under uh, Charles Abel, who was minister at the time. George is here, George Bobby. You're a doctor now, aren't you? Uh, congratulations, yeah. We, we worked together on this document, and it's called a Strategy for Responsible Sustainable Development. And in there, we talk about some of our strategic assets. Obviously, land is one of them. And so what I've tried to do in ECPIC is to target that using an existing government policy. So even though I haven't talked about the policy, what we are doing is actually aligned to the policy. And it, it just makes sense. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. There might be a hundred ways to arrive at the destination. You just need to pick one and pick the easiest one. All right? But the same principle that we've adopted for Agriculture can be applied in, in a variety of, of industries. You just have to build that environment where people feel comfortable to come and invest. And that environment, again, includes things like, for example, I mentioned cost of power. I didn't talk about all the other costs. You know, the difficulties of doing business in the country. They're all listed already. So our challenge would be to look at all of the impediments and find solutions. You either go around them or, like, for example, if we wanted to do large-scale large agriculture, and I've got an investor right now that needs half a million hectares of land so they can plant trees to produce paper. Why are they doing that? Well, they're just looking for space to grow trees. Their existing suppliers are not able to, well, they're worried about the security of their supplies. So they need an alternative source. It's kind of like vanilla. When people are short of vanilla, they look for security. They look for an alternative supply. It's just business. It's just commerce. It has realities. And business people just want to solve problems. That's all they do. They just solve problems. So if your country has an opportunity, then they come. And they look at everything. And then they figure out, how do I get access to half a million hectares of land so I can grow eucalyptus. You've got eucalyptus growing out here, those trees. And feed it through a mill and produce pulp so I can keep the largest paper factory in the world operating. 
the question for us now is how do we create that environment where, for example, our challenge is we don't want the landowner to lose the land. Mania like in DY. So how do we marry the two together so that we get the best of both worlds? We get 100,000 jobs, so our people are working, making money, looking after their families, paying for their kids' education, all those things that we, we desire. At the same time, this company picks up um, pulp for their paper mill. They're happy. The government collects tax. The government's happy, so we can go and bribe all of you and win the next election and come back again. <laughs> Everyone's happy. I think that's what we are trying to achieve. Agriculture is just a tool to an outcome. That's what it is. Thank you. We'll take one from uh, the middle. Him. Yeah, I'm Laurie from Sub National. And in my feature, you can see that I, the, the genes that I have, this is my platform to vertical up. You know, um, Gavin, it's nice to see you and I have listened to your presentation, especially on uh, area of uh, microeconomy to agriculture that you do. And my, my, my insight is that do what you really understand. Do things that you really know it. It's all about understanding. Here I'm talking about knowledge through education here. So uh, to, you, to us as a, a transformative uh, character that I see that, uh, is it that education and uh, the macroeconomics that you're doing can really bring that livelihood to our people as, as a politician yourself. Is it, is it those areas that we have? Because Papua New Guinea has a big space of knowledge that we have really, we have to really contextualize our, our, our thinking from the universal um, knowledge base. Um, so my question is, as, as a Melanesia, you know, is it education and uh, uh, the skill base um, that you have to dwell on that that will bring about good livelihood to us. Is it that uh, that you see? I'm, I'm just analyzing your how how you pick up your leadership to give a good um, uh, livelihood to our citizens. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, at the village level, what you want to do is just upskill people so that they utilize their resources better. That's all you want to do. If they want to go further with that, then I think they need to have options and choices so they can make those decisions themselves. I think empowering ordinary people is really about giving them choices and options. An empowered individual will make very different decisions to someone who is not. So whether that empowerment be in terms of earning an income in the village or having a better education, all of that empowerment just gives you access to better choices. That's all it does. Educating a woman gives her access to better choices. Uh, so too, the same applies to an ordinary villager. I'll give you a very basic concept of this. One of the struggles I had when we were trying to do cocoa, and I was trying to get people to produce what we call cocoa clones, because these are pot borer resistant. We have a pot borer problem in Isipik. And we have to replace something like I think it's 150 million cocoa trees. We have to replace them. Now, to do that using a conventional method, if you're buying seedlings, it's going to cost you five kina for one. So that's already up, you know, almost a billion kina. We can't afford that. So we had to get smart. We had to train people to produce their own clones. So all we did was give them the, the nursery. That's what we did. OK? Now, when we started, there were only about 12 people in the entire province, a province of about 800,000 people, who could produce clones. Today, there's probably 50,000 CPICs who can produce clones. Some of them are actually in school. School kids do this better than adults. So when we started, one, one Budwood nursery can produce around uh, 200,000 seedlings a year. All right? We've got more than 600 of them. And because the plants that are already in the ground, ECPIC now, this year we are going to produce around 10 million clones. We are the only province that has the capacity 
to produce around 30 million clones a year. But we had to build that, and we had to be smart about how we built it, and we had to use ordinary people with no skills to build it. So when I talk about skill, I'm talking about from that all the way up to training someone to, I guess, be a helicopter engineer, you know, or to be a medical technician, or, or whatever it is. Again, start from the need, work backwards. My struggle was I started off in a poor province, low income base, people had no income, what do you do? Rotem clear na stapia, mi blakatim busta sol na wogim. So of course we had to fight cocoa board. You couldn't produce a clone in Papua New Guinea unless you were licensed by the cocoa board. Well, I'm a CIPIC, so we can get fairly aggressive. A CIPIC's in this room, no. I'm, I was sitting between two of them in case you... <laughs> so I said to the cocoa board, don't come to my province. Just don't come at all. Stay in lay. Come when we are finished. Because I wanted to liberalize the knowledge. I didn't want it locked up in an institution. What's the point of having knowledge if people can't use it? You couldn't even own a Budwood garden without a license from the cocoa board. I'm like, what's this nonsense? Don't come to Sipic. Just don't come until we are finished. When you want to empower people, you've got to be hard about it. You've got to be cruel about it. Because one of the sad things I see in Papua New Guinea is that when a Papua New Guinean gets an important position and become a big man, we try to flex our little muscles and squeeze everybody out. Have you noticed that? You walk up to a government office and you can travel a professor and you ask for something, they say, sit down. <laughs> you go and wait in line at the back. And if they don't like you, well, they don't even save you. We, we've got these little inferiority complexes that tend to overly display themselves once we get a big position. Now. You know, we need a lot more humility in this country, real humility. <laughs> to me, it's about the ordinary citizen in my province. If they can be empowered in whatever way, whether it be education, using their land, using their fisheries resources, whatever it is, so that they can have options and choices, like you said. They can catch their own fish, feed themselves, pay their own school fees. You know, I, I, I bumped into uh, um, the guy, well, Mr. Seddon, who is now in charge of New Guinea, and he told me the fourth commercially viable airport in Papua New Guinea is WeWeg. It's the fourth commercially viable one that's making money for them. How did that happen? That happened because ordinary folks in the village had two coins in their pocket that they could rub together. That's how it happened. Why are ships waiting to birth? Why does ECP need a new wharf? It's simple. People need the demand for goods and services have increased. Why is fuel running out? Well, why, why are our roads getting smashed? We have too many cars on the road. I see these nice roads that people post on Facebook, man, nice little roads right there, just winding through the hills, not a single car on them. You come to ECP, our roads are smashed, cars are nose to tail. Too many vehicles. Like I said, good problems to have. And they, these problems come around when you empower people. Yes, and I think, I think that'd be a, a pretty nice way to end all of this, but one hand is short up. So that's the last one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Governor, can I take you away from the citizens' uh, advocacy and, and bring you to the political level? Um, at that political space, at that uh, parliamentary level, the strategy that you talked about, medical strategy, and you loved about it, are you already advocating it at that space? And if you are, what is your assessment of the success rate in, the last, in this remaining term of parliament? Sorry, can you repeat that? Um, I'm saying, I'm asking you the medical strategy that you talked about earlier on that you loved about, the medical strategy? 
tribe, yes. And at the political at the uh, political level, at, uh, are you already advocating that? And if you are, what is your success rate um, in this remaining term of parliament? That's a good question. Okay. <clears throat> um, the first thing we did was improve governance. Prior to that, we had a lot of misbehavior amongst the people that manage the health space. So I became chairman at the time, and we started to clean it up, and we instituted processes. The processes were already there. I didn't create them. We just made sure that we followed them. So the first thing we did was employ someone highly competent and honest to run the organization. That was the first thing we did. And he's someone who, when I think of him, he's, he's a mentor, someone I really respect. His name is Mark Maludu. So we ended up with Mark. And then when it was time for me to go, because I was running for the elections to become governor, I had to pick a replacement chairman. So I picked the person running the biggest business in ECP, the chairman of South Sea Tuna. I said, you've got 4,000 workers, you need the hospital. You, you come and take my place. So we ended up with a good chairman. Today, our chairman is a, a brilliant person by the name of Pastor Max Manimbi. So we are maintaining that level of good governance within the health space. When they went out to recruit, all the CIPIC said, I'm walk blah, me blah. Me blah, CIPIC must kiss him. You know, CIPICs can be fairly aggressive. The good thing is I'm a civic too. Max is a civic too. We had civics in there who were, wanted the best for our people. So they picked someone from West New Britain. And he's brilliant. So he knows how to run the facility. I mean, he worked it out. Like, for instance, when, when the prime minister goes around and gives five million kina checks to members of parliament, uh, we had... Uh, Prime Minister O'Neill come and give five million to some of our open members to build hospitals. So we had a meeting. Uh, the CEO rang me and said, Governor, can you get the members so I can talk to them? So I organized the meeting. And the CEO said to them, I can get you World Bank funding to build your district hospitals. One member of parliament, member for Ambunti Dragikia, stood up with his five million kina check and just gave it straight to the... Um, CEO, Ambunti District Hospital got built in two years. It's complete, it's running now, it's got four doctors. <laughs> some of the hospitals where the member is trying to build it himself, uh, they've been building for 12 years now, some of them. <laughs> so just as an example, get good, competent people to run these things. And whatever you do, don't pick your one talk. Because that's the worst thing you can do. And this is what I tell governors. Huh? Don't pick your campaign manager to go and be there. Because campaign manager, and by talk. Ah, uh, me stop, now you stop. <laughs> you got Dina Lomia. Finish. He'll run the thing down, kill it. And you lose the next election. So don't ever, you know, rule of thumb, don't ever pick your one talks for these things. Pick competent people who are going to give value back. And that's what we did. So having the right people there... Uh, you know, our clinical facility cost 210 million to build. It's one of the cheapest facilities in the country. Yet it's the only place in the country where you can have laser eye surgery. You want to you fix your eyes? Come to WeWay.